Hello, everybody. Welcome into Sports by GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Jeremy Lapidus. Today is Monday, September 23rd. I hope everybody had a great weekend, and what a wild weekend of sports it was. We will be taking a look at all of the biggest news from around the world of football. Lots of NFL to cover, lots of college football to cover, and of course, a double header tonight in the NFL with two games taking place on this Monday night. We'll talk about both of those as well, but before we get into any of that, remember, if you would like to be an even bigger part of the show than you already are, all you need to do is go to gsmcpodcast.net, or if you are on YouTube, you can use that super chat feature. If you do either of those two things, a message should pop up on the bottom of the screen for you, me, and everybody else around the world to see. If you do have a burning question about sports, anything at all that you would like to ask, go ahead and throw that in the comments, throw it in the chat. I will get to it as soon as I possibly can. I appreciate everybody so much for sticking around, talking some sports with me here on a beautiful Monday, September 23rd. But like I was saying, we are going to start off our show in the NFL. It was a wild weekend, one, in my opinion, that was headlined by Sam Darnold and the Vikings. Sam Darnold has completely changed the conversation around him this season. There was always that chance, that outlier of a chance, that he was going to be this great quarterback. He got to really test it for the first time this season against a really good team. We saw them do it against the 49ers earlier. Now, that was an awesome win, but it felt like the 49ers were beating themselves more than anything, or that Vikings defense really stole the show. And while that Vikings defense continued to be awesome, while Brian Flores continues to put a stamp of authority on this league, proving why he is one of the best defensive coordinators currently in the game with his blitz schemes and blitz packages, being able to confuse some of the most talented quarterbacks in the entirety of the NFL, this game, a 34-7 to utter domination of the Houston Texans, a team that I and many people thought were among the Super Bowl contenders, especially after a strong start to their season, sending them packing at up in Minnesota, making C.J. Stroud look pedestrian. This was a game where this was a battle of who can keep the ball clean, who can win the turnover battle. And C.J. Stroud, who has been amazing, just amazing at not turning the ball over. Had a couple of close calls throughout this entire season, throughout the first couple of weeks of the year. Regardless, he has but just been amazing at not turning the ball over. The Vikings get two interceptions out of him. Two interceptions out of a guy who has been almost mistake-free. Now, not having a run game for the for the for the Houston Texans was a huge issue. Obviously, down Joe Mixon after a hip drop tackle on Sunday night, but you still had Cam Akers, who's proven to be a capable starter in the league. A lot of props goes to that defense, that Vikings defense, as they dominate. They are definitely a top 10 team in this league, and as the NFC continues to just get more and more muddled, you could make the argument that they are up there as far as NFC contenders. Now, I'm not going to go that far, but there is a stat that now the Vikings are 20-0. and That's right, 20-0, and undefeated, when Kevin O'Connell is the coach and they win or tie the turnover battle. So as long as Sam Darnold continues to not turn the ball over, he doesn't even have to throw for four touchdowns every game. That's not a realistic thing. We're not going to sit here and be like, you know what we need Sam Darnold to do? Throw four touchdowns. 181 yards, four touchdowns, 17 of 28 passing. Sam Darnold was amazing. Again, Justin Jefferson having him out there as a weapon, very, very helpful. But this Vikings team has been incredibly impressive to me. They were coming into a season, losing their quarterback, dealing with plenty of injuries, dealing with issues on and off the field. And Brian Flores, that defense, and Kevin O'Connell in that offense have just done miracles on this team. Really made them play to the to the best of their ability and more. And I'd like to see this keep up. They've had two tests now. They've made it through two tests. They've taken business against two of the better teams in the league in the 49ers and the Texans. There's not much more you can ask of them. I think this, this Vikings team is absolutely a top 10 te team in the league, and they're going to be dangerous if they continue to play this brand of football. 
outside of the Vikings, I want to turn our attention to the Broncos. How about Bo Nix and the Broncos absolutely dismantling the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? We had a team in the Tampa Bay Buccaneers that we expected a lot out of, especially after week one, their incredible offensive performance versus the Commanders. Now, we do know that the Commanders secondary is not very good, but Baker Mayfield looked solid, looked like he was earning that contract. He took a little bit of a step back in a week two win, but against the Broncos, a team that looks hapless, that had looked hapless, against the Broncos, a team that looked like they couldn't push the ball down the field, the Bucks just couldn't get anything going. Their defense seemingly could not stop the Broncos' offense, something that every other team had been able to do so far. Bo Nix, while he did not throw for a touchdown, had plenty of guys out there open. He had he hit Cortland Sutton for plenty of deep plays. He was able to expand the field. This is something that they weren't able to do for the majority of the first couple of weeks. We talked about this stat after week two. Bo Nix had not been able to accurately throw the ball more than five yards down the field. They had not been able to run the ball very well. They were able to do all of that on Sunday, leading to a 26-7 to win. And a lot of this is just... I, I don't want to say I don't I don't want to just skip over the Broncos because they played good football. This is the kind of Broncos, this is the kind of Sean Payton team that we expected a little bit. This is we wanted to see when Sean Payton came out of retirement to coach the Broncos team. His his offense went a little more smooth under Bo Nix. There were calls for him to be benched as early as last week. He is a rookie, so give him some time. But now we take a look at what they were able to do against a Buccaneers defense that, you know, while it isn't the most inspiring you had a couple of great plays made by your wide receiver you didn't get much room going although tyler bought batty was able to get almost in yards a kick which kind of came out of nowhere there uh, regardless of that bo Nix showed some great pocket presence being able to escape uh from crowded pockets pick up large chunks of stuff large chunks of yards on the ground as well as through the air be like i said being able to push the ball downfield that is the big takeaway from the game not only was he doing his thing getting those dinks and dunks like he usually does he was able to get those down the field throws to a successful point that is not something we've seen out of the broncos and if they can continue to do this they don't have the toughest schedule in the world this isn't a broncos team that i'm looking at and saying wow they're not going to win a game all season there are other teams I was talking about that, and we'll get to them later on in the show. But the Broncos weren't one of those teams. The Broncos are a team that absolutely stood a chance. The Broncos are a team that if everything went right for them, there's an outside shot that they're talking about a wild card spot. Now, that's way too much. I didn't I didn't I never liked Bo Nix. That was just their absolute ceiling. But what they did against the Bucs, I think it's more of a referendum on them. We talk about the Buccaneers, and after that week one win against the Commanders, they kind of took a big step back. Against the Lions, while they did win that game, the offense and Baker Mayfield wasn't nearly as explosive. Mike Evans did not get involved in either of these last two games, and he's a guy that, the, that Baker Mayfield and the Buccaneers' offense need to get involved if they want to be successful. There's a reason he's been able to put up a thousand yards with every single year in every single year of his career. It's not because he's some slouch. He's because he is that guy. He is that number one option that you want in a contending team. He is an alpha receiver over there. And while Chris Godwin is great, I love Chris Godwin. You need to get Mike Evans the ball. You need to get him the ball more than they've gotten him in the last couple of weeks. He doesn't need to score two touchdowns like he did in week one. But he does need to get more targets than just he needs to get more targets than three he needs to get targeted more than three times in a game two for 17 on three targets is unacceptable for a guy like mike evans he needs to get targeted more and baker needs to they need to start designing plays for him baker needs to start looking for him if they want to be more successful and turn their season around i'm a little worried for the buccaneers if they're giving up this many points to a bad broncos defense and the last one I wanted to touch on in this segment, and we'll get to a couple of other big games uh, in the next segment, Green Bay and Malik Willis. 
heading into Tennessee to take on the guy that the Titans replaced Malik Willis with in Will Levis. Will Levis has had his fair share of issues all season long. Will Levis, famously in the first two weeks, has had a couple of pictures, uh, you know, go viral on the internet. A couple of ridiculous moments there. Not the kind of things you're looking for as part of, you know, a real NFL quarterback. But this Packers team, kudos to them. Start off 0-1, lose their franchise quarterback, a guy that they just paid $55 million a year in the offseason. They lose him to an injury that seemingly he's going to beat faster than anybody else in the history. He was almost ready almost to not miss an entire, not, not to miss one game. He's missed two. There's a chance he comes back soon. But Malik Willis has been really good. He's turned me into a fan a little bit. What he's able to do with his legs, we always knew. But since he's what he's been able to do as a passer in this in this Lafleur system has been really, really impressive to me. Thirteen of nineteen for two hundred and two yards and a touchdown through the air, keeping the ball safe, adding another seventy three on the ground and another touchdown. That extra layer of offense. I talk about quarterback mobility all the time. I talk about how that rushing upside is a huge part of the nowadays NFL especially with passing yards down, that's because, you know, you have this extra threat of the quarterback running, right? And running against a less crowded box is going to be even better. But this is very, very, very impressive stuff that I'm seeing out of a young guy that hadn't gotten a lot of chances to start after a disastrous rookie season. This is what you want to see improvement. This is not going to make Will. Le- uh, this is not going to make Malik Willis a hot commodity. This is not going to make Malik Willis one of those guys that everyone's clamoring for in the offseason. He's not going to get a starter kind of contract. But what he's been able to do in this short stretch with the Packers, and for however long it lasts, at least what he's been able to do so far, this is going to keep him alive in the NFL, at least as a very good serviceable backup, a guy that can come in and spell your guy for a couple of weeks in case of an injury. He's a young player that soaks up the system really quickly. He He's barely been in the Packers locker room for a month at this point, and he's running that offense very, very effectively. That is awesome to see. This is what I want to see more of. On the other end, for the Titans, that defense that was so good kind of disappeared. That's not to say that the defense still isn't very good. But you'd expect them to play better after going up against, in my opinion, stronger competition than Malik Willis. We need to start having a real conversation about whether or not Will Levis should continue to be the starter in Tennessee. Backing him up there is Mason Rudolph. Mason Rudolph is a guy who took the Steelers to a playoff at the end of the season last year. Mason Rudolph is a guy who's proven he can be a little bit successful in this league, and I'm not one to give up on a quarterback that quickly. I don't want to be that but if Will Levis can't keep the ball safe like he's continued to do to another two interceptions, two there were two touchdowns to be fair, but this Titans offense is not good enough to sustain with the amount of interceptions and boneheaded plays that Will Levis has been able has been making all season long. If he is able to clean up his turnovers, keep him in the lineup. But these be a short lease that's starting to get pulled on Will Levis for this season. We're going to take a quick break here. When we come back, we're going to review three more games that I thought were interesting in week three of NL, so stick around for that. We'll be right back here on Sports by GSMC Podcast Network. 